Thank you. Uh, don't clap too much or I'll start to expect that every class <laughs> when, I, when I teach. So it's, we're, we're all friends here. Um, a couple of things as I begin today. One is uh, I want to mention that uh, what I'm presenting here uh, is a kind of summary and a distillation of uh, an article that was published uh, in the April 2016 uh, Calvin Theological Journal. Uh, and so if you want to get uh, the, the more in-depth uh, argument, uh, you can go there because I can't quite say everything that I said in about a 30-page article in 30 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to make clear uh, the argumentation there. The other thing I want to mention is, is that um, my ability to write this article actually uh, grew out of uh, my sabbatical. Uh, Kuiper College every so often will grant its professors a semester of leave. Uh, in order to uh, partly have a break from the normal routine, but also to be able to do scholarship like this. Uh, and so I just want to make you guys aware of this is something that your professors do. This is something that Kuiper College actually uh, values, that you know, we have a small faculty, uh, but they let us do this every so often, uh, because this kind of stuff, this kind of stuff is important. Uh, all right, I, I had no idea that hair was such a popular topic, uh, but uh, I, guess, I guess it is. And I'll admit at the outset, uh, I'm most nervous about practical questions like, what about the mullet or the man bun or the, the afro? How does this all work? What, so, so, so we'll try to go. I, I haven't totally thought through the implications for the mullet, um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this happens. Uh, so I want to start with thinking about the text of Scripture itself. So 1 Corinthians 11 uh, is this passage that, that verses 2 through 16 uh, have all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, that keeps scholars busy thinking about um, men and women and the way that it talks about hair, the way that it talks about uh, head and what that means because Paul in this context uses head both in a literal way uh, but also in a metaphorical way. Um, but this is the text of 1 Corinthians 11, 14. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. Now, if you're like me, uh, you might read this and have questions and say, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's good. As a good Bible student, it's important to say that. If the Bible always makes perfect sense to you, there's a good chance you're reading into the Bible instead of letting it kind of trouble you and, and prompt you to ask questions. Uh, and so even think about a basic question like, doesn't nature teach you? What could that possibly mean? Uh, I read that and I think it doesn't seem so natural uh, when I break out the clippers uh, to cut my uh, four-year-old son's hair. Does that seem natural to keep his hair short? That seems kind of artificial, man-made. I'm doing something there. Uh, his hair doesn't just fall out once it starts to hit his collar. Right? So what does it mean to say that nature teaches you uh, that a man uh, with long hair is, is disgraceful, uh, but a woman with long hair, that, that's for her glory. What does this mean? So part of what we want to do is look for the underlying moral logic. Uh, I, I like this phrase a lot. Uh, it's a phrase that's used by Dr. James Brownson from Western Seminary. The idea here is when the Bible says something, we have to dig deeper and say, why does it say this? It's not just the command. It's not just about, okay, having short hair or long hair, but why would Paul seem to imply that this is what, this is what people should do? And especially if we want to think about how we apply this text for us, to us today, we have to dig deeper and try to understand what's the, what's the moral logic uh, behind this. Uh, now, a lot of people look at nature. That, that's especially my focus here is what does Paul mean when he makes this appeal to nature? Uh, a lot of scholars uh, look at nature, and, and this is Greek, sorry, but without the mark, proper markings, Professor Hogeboom, um, nature as custom. Uh, and so you go to the sources and you start to read what they say. Many of them say something like this. Jack Rogers, scholar, says natural or nature here uh, just means uh, conventional or unconventional. And so if something is unnatural, it's against nature. It's unconventional. If something is, uh, you know, if nature teaches it to you, this is just another way to say it's customary uh, or convention. Uh, Victor Paul Furnish says it's just an appeal to social convention. Um, Matthew Vines in his book, uh, God and the Gay Christian, says nature just is this appeal to, to custom. And so you see people saying this uh, repeatedly. Richard Hayes, another scholar, says nature, he actually says this is kind of a weird use of 
fusis or nature, it means convention as understood by Paul. Um, and he says, he, he in, in fact flags this and says, usually this isn't how, what people mean when they use the term nature, but apparently that's what, that's what Paul means here. Uh, Roy Champa and Brian Rossner, again, another example of scholars who say uh, that nature is custom. Uh, Richard Horsley asked the question that, that I posed a couple minutes ago. Well, you look around the ancient world, even in Paul's world, there were plenty of examples of men who wore their hair long. Uh, so even there, it gets a little bit confusing to say it's customary or conventional because it's not like all men in the ancient world had short hair and all women had long hair. Uh, and so what, you know, Paul just sounds uh, confusing here. Now you might say, um, I appreciate you're really interested in this topic because you want to know about you know, men's hair being short, women's hair being long. What should we, how should we cut our hair today? Uh, this passage is significant. Um, not simply for how we think about men's and women's hair length, uh, but because of thinking about uh, what nature means in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, and what it might mean in Romans 1. Okay, so Romans 1, Paul says this. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Hair length is not that big of a topic in our culture today. Uh, human sexuality, particularly same-sex sexual activity, is a big topic. And so as scholars look at this, they're trying to say, um, okay, if Paul, when Paul appeals to nature, if he just means custom or convention in 1 Corinthians 11, Maybe that's all that's going on in Romans 1. And so when Paul condemns same-sex sexual activity, why is he condemning it? Well, it's just not normal. It's not conventional. Uh, and so if his appeal there is just to say it's not normal in their culture or in their context, maybe in other contexts where it is seen as normal, uh, it's actually not, not a big deal and maybe not morally wrong. And so this is where 1 Corinthians 11 and this whole discussion about hair length actually gets tied into current debates around same-sex relationships and, and how to think about this. Because if Paul just means customer convention, right, how many, you know, look around this room, not every woman has long hair, uh, not every man has short hair. Why? Because in our culture, that, you know, you still see that to some degree, but it's not an absolute. And so just as that changes, uh, maybe our norms for human sexuality, maybe that should change as well. Right? So this is significant. So the scholars you saw me list on the previous page, um, actually the first, uh, the first three um, come from the affirming perspective. Scholars who are specifically arguing that same-sex relationships are, are permissible, that they're okay, um, according to scripture. Whereas the last couple would say uh, it's not. And so what's interesting to me is scholars across the board in this debate about same-sex relationships, they all seem to agree, at least, about what <coughs> Paul is saying uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, that this is just an appeal uh, to custom or convention. That's what they say. I say, <laughs> see what I'm doing there? I, I never stop teaching. Um, uh, this is what I say. Uh, the moral logic of 1 Corinthians 11:14 is not merely an appeal to custom, but it's to what Paul and the Corinthians understood to be a physiological difference between male and female. Right? So it, it's a physical, physiological difference that, that Paul is looking at. And so as I, as I looked at this and started to dig into this text, kind of driven by the fact that this doesn't totally make sense, and this is what all these other people say, um, but I started to ask this question. Are there other examples of authors from, from Paul's world, from antiquity, who speak of phusis in the context of hair and sexual difference? Right? So we read Paul and we think this sounds really strange to us, um, but was this kind of language, this way of talking about hair, sexual difference, hair length, do we find this in other ancient authors? That's an important question uh, to try to answer. Um, because as we look at this, we can either say a couple of things. Uh, either Paul is using phusis in an absolutely unique way, because if you, go, you know, if you go and look up what does this word mean, how is it typically used, um, as, as Richard Hayes points out, it typically does not refer merely to convention or custom. 
Right? That's, that's typically not how it works. And in fact, in the passage of 1 Corinthians 11, what's interesting there is right after this in, in verse 16, Paul also says, by the way, you know, this is the practice of all the churches. And so in verse 16, he's appealing to something like custom or convention. And so it seems a little strange that he would make this appeal to custom and convention followed by an appeal to custom and convention. Like this appeal to nature is something a little bit different. Um, so maybe Paul is using this word in this kind of unique way, or maybe Paul's logic doesn't make sense to us because uh, we're missing something. We're missing something from their context, something that they shared, uh, that they knew, uh, that we simply don't. And so we read this and we think, this sounds confusing. Uh, again, Paul and his audience are in a high context situation. They all are familiar with a lot of these things that, that, that we may not be. We have to do some work. We're in a low context situation to bridge the gap between Paul's world uh, and our world. All right, everybody hanging with me so far? All right, so when we think about what, what do they share in common, what do they have in common, are there other examples of authors who say things like this, uh, you actually get uh, several examples of Stoic philosophers uh, who speak in a way similar to what we find in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, and this is significant because Stoicism is probably the most influential philosophy in the Greco-Roman world at the time of the New Testament. Um, in a nutshell, one way to think about Stoicism uh, is a kind of glorified pantheism, that there is uh, there's this divine logic that is built, a divine logos, suffused through creation. And so part of the goal of the Stoic is to understand the nature of reality so that they can live in accordance with that reality. Uh, right? To say there is this objective reality, that there's, a, there's a logic to nature, there's a logic to the universe around us, and even there's something divine about that. And so I need to figure out how to live my life uh, in accordance uh, with that. It's also important to recognize that for ancient philosophers, um, they were not what we would think of today as philosophers. Uh, they, they did address philosophical topics, but they also were very interested in things like biology and physiology. And so when you have philosophers like Aristotle, one of the main things he does is try to classify all these different kinds of living beings, right? What you would do in more of a biology class today than a philosophy class. So philosophers are interested in this <laughs> wide range of knowledge uh, as they think about uh, the nature of reality. Uh, and so three Stoics, I think, give us some interesting uh, insight. Uh, one is Masonius Rufus. Uh, and in his writings, uh, he points us back to Zeno, who is the founder of Stoicism, uh, and actually points out that Zeno addressed whether it's in accord with nature for men to cut their hair. So significantly, the founder of Stoicism, the most influential philosophy of, of, in biblical times, New Testament times, is engaging this question, right? Because there's, right, as they think about the nature of reality, even how they cut their hair, they want to do this in accordance with, right, the way things are, uh, right? That they, would, that they would be responsive to that. Uh, and in fact, you know, um, Zeno and several of the Stoics said, uh, at least for men, even when they cut their hair, it should be short, uh, but uh, it also should not be kind of for cosmetic or aesthetic purposes, uh, like just bowl cut straight around, uh, right? Axe products, definitely no, uh, right? That's, that's, outside, that's outside the lines. Um, but it's significant for us to say, okay, here's a piece of the puzzle. Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, is addressing the same issue that Paul is uh, addressing in 1 Corinthians 11. The other thing to see here is that in, in uh, Rufus, nature calls for a human response. So oftentimes, this is where, when you think about what, is, what does hair do without human interference? Well, it just grows. And so on the one hand, it, it seems strange for us to say that cutting the hair is natural. Uh, but part of what they would say is, is, is something like this. Well, when we see differences between male and female, right, and we do see physical and physiological differences between male and female, part of what we're supposed to do is in some ways, underscore and recognize those differences. Uh, and so one way to uphold and kind of signal male-female difference is for men to wear their hair short, women uh, to wear their, their hair long. 
And so when we talk about what does nature teach us, we're not talking about humans simply being passive, but we're talking about humans making decisions that are in line with nature. Right? So to talk about nature doesn't exclude human activity, human response uh, to this. Uh, Epictetus, uh, he, this is another Stoic philosopher, and in one of his discourses, it's very fascinating because it, it's almost a parallel to Romans 1, where Paul, Paul talks about, you look at creation, you should see God, you should see this reality shining through creation. Uh, and Epictetus says something very similar. Right? The person who is ungrateful, who never shows gratitude, is a complete and blind fool. Uh, but whereas Paul goes on then to talk about actually human sexuality and how this kind of gets flipped right, from uh, male to female to male to male, uh, Epictetus goes on to talk about facial hair. Right? And talking about how facial hair, right, what's the point of facial hair? Well, Epictetus says in, in part it's meant to signal this kind of male female difference, right? That even something that it kind of seems like it doesn't have that much of a function, right? It kind of keeps you warm in the winter, but, you know, only to a certain degree. You know, somebody might say, well, Epictetus, you know, you're talking about this divine logos and how all nature just shows these things. What's the point of my beard? Um, and he would say, well, partly uh, it serves this function to delineate uh, male and female. Uh, and he says, that this is similar to what we've been talking about with Rufus, that human beings have the power of using appearances rationally. That as we look at the world, our intellect perceives this difference there between male and female. And that part of what we do is we actually accentuate those differences. Right? That, that we kind of underscore the fact that we are different uh, in certain ways. Uh, so again, to say you should respond to nature doesn't mean you're doing something unnatural. It means you're living in, in line with, you're in tune with this difference. Uh, and responding uh, accordingly. And he's very critical uh, of men who would pluck their body hair or who would shave. Uh, he, he says shaving, taking away those distinctive male markers uh, is like taking away the cause of the hairs, your underlying masculinity. Right? This is, I want to be clear, this is Epictetus, not me. Uh, right? <laughs> men who shave this morning are like, oh no. Uh, Right? But, but that, that would have been his point. It's like, why are you doing that? Uh, right? Olympic divers, how dare you? Uh, right? You don't want to do this because, it, uh, again, it kind of collapses those distinctive markers. Uh, and by the way, he might say, on, on the other hand, uh, you might think, well, uh, I'm a woman. Why should I shave my legs? Right? He would say women are less hairy. And so doing that, again, accentuates that distinctiveness. Um, Feminine distinctiveness. The other thing that's really interesting about Epictetus is, uh, in this one discourse, he's uh, uh, rebuking uh, this man who is kind of failing to heed him. And he says, what should we do with this guy who basically is collapsing gender differences and is all confused about these things? We should make him a citizen of Corinth. <coughs> Maybe even make him prefect of the city. Put him in charge of the youth. Right? In other words, what, it, just in passing, if you want to talk about a city where people are confused about sexuality, gender difference, what are you going to talk about? Where are you going to go? <coughs> Corinth. All right? That's, that's significant. Um, so Corinth factors in here. Uh, a couple of others, uh, briefly. Seneca, when he talks about this, it's interesting. He says physiology and ethics are linked. And so he says there's, there is this distinction between male and female. Uh, but he says women who start to act like men, and actually uh, not good men, women who start to act like debauched men who spend their time in drunken revelries and parties and all kind of uh, um, sexual immorality, those women actually start to suffer from men's diseases, as he thought about it, which included gout and baldness. Right, so he said, th this is kind of strange. In, in his mind, what you see there is that even though nature, again, nature has this distinction between male and female, our action in their minds can have an influence on that. Women who start to act like men start to actually, in their bodies, suffer from uh, men's diseases. Also, again, interesting to think about when you know, Paul's language in Romans 1, in terms of people who make this exchange and then begin to suffer in themselves uh, the, the results of that. So it's, it's interesting to hear some of these, some of these parallels that are there. Uh, Helmut Koester uh, summarizes it this way. Hair and beard styles 
especially offer the stoic diatribe significant examples of a fundamentally illegitimate violation of nature. And here, you may disagree with the Stoics' view of nature, uh, but I think you have to admit that it's an appeal to nature. It's not an appeal to custom. Right? So human beings still today will argue about what is nature or what is natural. Right? Does nature teach you that you should be uh, a vegetarian and that will be health, more healthy for you or not? Uh, or this food or that food, right? So we might disagree about <coughs> what is according to nature, but what we're trying to do there is making appeals uh, to nature. Now the roots of Stoicism, if, if we take a step back uh, and understand the influence of uh, Hippocrates and Aristotle. Um, Hippocrates, very influential in terms of medicine. Aristotle, very influential in terms of, of philosophy. To go back and see how they thought about this, because I think their thought affected the Stoics uh, of the, uh, of, uh, who affected the world of Corinth, the thought world of Corinth at the time of Paul. Uh, and as we do this, it's important to, th to recognize the nature of scientific paradigms. Part of what Hippocrates and Aristotle, and what I'm going to tell you, sounds very strange to us today. Uh, but it's important to see that this way of thinking about things did have some kind of explanatory power. It was a model for how human beings worked. And as they looked at this, they tried to figure out how, how is how are all these things linked when you look at the human body and how do these work together? And so rather than first rushing to say, well, that's obviously false, um, we might step back and say there, there's an element of truth in this. For example, one of the main differences they said, men's bodies uh, are hotter, there's more heat in men's bodies uh, than women's, which are colder, right? And use kind of heat and cool or hot and cold as these kind of technical terms and this explains many of the differences between men and women. Now, we might look at that today and say, well, you know, my doctor did a CAT scan, discovered no heat, uh, right, or no coolness. Uh, but if, if actually, if you replace heat with testosterone, a lot of what they say adds up and makes perfect sense even in our paradigm today, that there are these, these basic differences. Um, but one of the key things for them is this distinction between something being according to nature uh, or against or contrary to nature. Because this is the kind of language that Paul is going to use uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 and in Romans 1. What I want you to see is I think for the way we hear these terms today, it's probably better uh, to translate against nature as something like unhealthy, at least in many of these uh, scientific treatises about how does the human body work, what does this mean? Uh, so uh, Seneca, who I mentioned before, and Cicero, another thinker, uh, they qualify many things as against nature, including hot baths, banquets after sunset, right? Include pizza in the dorms after sunset, uh, drinking on an empty stomach, and we look at these things, it causes us some questions. Uh, in fact, Matthew Vines in his book, God and the Gay Christian, kind of says, look, there's all these things. They thought they were against nature. Clearly, these are just kind of strange customs of the, uh, of the ancient world. You can put this thing in 1 Corinthians 11 about hair in here. You can put this thing in Romans 1 about uh, same-sex relationships in here. And just understand that these are kind of things that they thought about as unconventional or not traditional or not customary. But I think this misunderstands uh, what these authors mean when they say that something's against nature. Their point is not that you can never take hot baths, but they actually think that it's unhealthy for you to take hot baths. They think it's unhealthy for you to uh, have a banquet after sunset. So what they're doing, again, they might be wrong about whether it's healthy or not, but what they're trying to do is they're appealing to uh, something in the way things are teaches us that you can do these things, but in some ways you're going to be going against nature. Right? This is what happens when you order a pizza at midnight, and then you eat half the thing. Your body will tell you this is against nature. Uh, right? Maybe not right away. It's going to tell you this is good. This is good at first. Uh, and then suddenly you're going to realize uh, that, was, that was a poor decision. So this is the difficult trying to look back on their world and say, what, what do they mean by these things? It's not just an appeal to custom, much the way somebody would say, you know, well, uh, you can't smoke in restaurants or many public places. 
Uh, why? Because we're actually appealing to something about secondhand smoke, the science of that and the way things are to help us understand what we should do. All right. Get ready. So when Hippocrates and Aristotle then thought about how the human body worked, uh, hair is closely connected to the reproductive faculties. Uh, and it's important to, to kind of understand their paradigm for how this, this all works. Uh, and so if you don't know how babies are made, you may find out shortly. Um, <laughs> so in, in their understanding, for Plato, Aristotle, Hippocrates, their understanding was for men, uh, semen is produced and largely stored in the head. Uh, and so uh, when you have intercourse, semen has to flow from the head down to the genitals. In part, this was how they understood in men the role of testicles. The testicles are a kind of weight that helps to pull the semen down from the head, uh, right, uh, to the male genitalia. Now, it, it's interesting to see a couple of other, you know, the ways that they talk about. Hippocrates says men who've had, had surgery, who, who've had ears where there's been an incision made, um, he said often what happens is those men are infertile. Why? Because the scar tissue builds up and it blocks the passageway of the semen uh, to the genitals. Right? You might say, well, that's really weird. But we're, part, we're just trying to understand what's their paradigm, what's their model for how this all works. And so for Hippocrates, sunken ears, uh, Aristotle says, because especially the semen is, is kind of in the, the mid part, the front part uh, of the head, Aristotle says uh, men whose eyes are really sunken back in their heads, that's a result of having too much sex. Right? So this, that, that, you, know, there's, you can kind of perceive that just by looking at somebody. The other interesting thing is the production of semen is, is correlated with, and, and especially for Hippocrates, actually causes facial and body hair. Uh, and so um, hair is nourished by moisture. Semen is one kind of moisture. As uh, boys hit puberty and the semen starts to travel through their body, what happens? Well, they start to grow some better than others, facial hair, uh, right? And so this happens, and, and in fact, uh, that in some sense, hair grows as it receives more moisture, uh, and so this is partly explains why as a man's life goes on, he may get hairier, all right? So this, this, this happens. Aristotle then thought, if you, if you can't grow a beard, this is probably a sign of sterility, right? That, that you can't have kids, uh, because something is not functioning properly uh, in your body. Uh, Hippocrates, this is interesting, also says this really helps us explain certain features of uh, baldness uh, and eunuchs. Uh, eunuchs don't go bald because here, here's how baldness happens. You've always wondered. Um, in the way that he thought about it, uh, when a man has intercourse, uh, the semen in his head froths up. Some men have what they call phlegm, okay, also in their head. And for those particular men who have an excess of phlegm, when the semen and phlegm combines, it starts to burn the roots out of their hair. So if you're bald, it's because you have an excess of phlegm, all right? And maybe you've had sex for a while, right? Because this is, as they think about it, this is, I mean, look at male pattern baldness. Where do men go bald? Does it, does it start back here and go up? No. Well, why does it start generally here? Right? Everybody's like, I despise their scientific paradigms. Then when I ask, everyone's like, I don't know, right? It just, it just happens. It happens. Um, and, and here's maybe the most interesting part of this paradigm. Hair exerts suction on moisture, including semen. Um, and so they, they talk about this in some different ways. They say people's hair partly changes color because of the moisture that's in the air. Uh, and so typically, you know, when they looked at um, uh, different ethnic groups and people who lived in different places, they said that's because there's a certain kind of moisture that might condense or get into their body, and then uh, you see this in kind of a uniform color uh, of hair. The place with the most hair, however, exerts uh, a kind of suction on moisture. And so for Aristotle and Hippocrates, part of the nature of, of men, this is what men do, is expel seed. Right? That's part of how they're made. That's a basic difference between women whose function in part, nature of women, is to receive seed. This is how life goes on, is this male and female difference. 
Uh, and so it would be significant then uh, that when you have people engaging in sexual intercourse, uh, what kind of suction do you want? You don't want the man uh, kind of holding back the seed. Right? You need to expel the seed so the woman can receive it into her womb, and there's life. Um, so one interesting example of this, both Aristotle and Hippocrates, part of the tests for female infertility uh, is typically uh, um, uh, a, certain, uh, a certain kind of mixture would be prepared that often was, was, would include garlic or something of a pretty strong odor and would actually be put in a woman's uterus. The next day, uh, they would see how much do they smell from the top of her head. And if there was a lack of, right, if they didn't smell anything, they would assume her, her body is not working as it's supposed to be. Because if it's, if it's working as it's supposed to be, you're going to have the seed and this, the smell being drawn up even to, to her head because that's, that's what hair that's what hair does. So, everybody clear? All right, so hair on the head, this is what I think is important. It's not merely a social marker of gender, but for Hippocrates and Aristotle, and, and I think many of the Stoics and following them, it's an interconnected functional part of the body's reproductive system. So long hair on a man would be against nature because it stops the human body, the, the male body, from doing what it's supposed to do, from functioning in the way it's supposed to do. Right? This is why people go to uh, infertility doctors. They say something is, something is parafusin. Something is not operating in the way it's supposed to be um, because new life is not happening. Um, however, long hair on a woman would be according to nature. It would actually help her body to function as it should. Uh, and so when Paul appeals to nature in this way, and we look at this and think this, is, this, this doesn't make sense, I don't understand what this could be or how this could be functioning, with this background, uh, I think it helps us get a little bit more sense of why, you know, why does Paul say this? Why might he appeal uh, to nature in this way? Um, so a couple of things, I'll, I'll mention one of these, uh, skip the other. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Paul goes on to talk about uh, body life. Now, not our physical bodies, but the church body. And he says there are many members of the body. He talks about honorable, less honorable members. Um, what do you do with, the, these, with some members of your body? Well, you cover them. You cover them, right? And so you cover your private parts. And Paul says, you know, the parts we deem less honorable, we clothe with great care. One way I think you could look at this uh, is to think about this reference that we've just heard in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul has just told someone to cover something, and he talks about this head covering. Um, why? Craig Keener, other scholars suggest that for the church at Corinth, it wasn't just that they thought you know, that hair was attractive, but they actually thought about a woman's hair as a private part. Right? That a woman's hair is, just as a man's testicles help to pull the semen down to expel it, so for a woman, uh, hair is kind of the counterpoint of that, that it helps to pull the seed into her body. Um, in that way, if you look at it that way, a woman's hair would be genitalia. Right? What do you do with genitalia? Well, you cover, you cover it. Um, all right, I'll skip this. We can come back to it if we want to in question time. So maybe one implication application is uh, proper attire for worship. This is where, when you understand the underlying moral logic, if, if part of what's going on here uh, is this understanding of the human body, you know, we all get this. This is what, you know, when people go to church, they wear pants, right? And they clothe themselves in a proper way. That's the underlying point here is when you come to worship uh, that, that you would want to do something like this. Um, I also think that, that based on this, you cannot use 1 Corinthians 11, 14 as part of the case for affirming same-sex sexual activity. In other words, you can't just say, Paul appeals to custom here, and so maybe what's going on in Romans 1 is just kind of an appeal to custom or convention. I think both in Romans 1 and in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, he's appealing to what they would have understood as, as nature. Um, I also think there is this fundamental, fundamental biblical principle that's underscored here, and that is male-female uh, differentiation. And so I think you see all throughout Scripture, going back to Genesis 1, is there is this givenness of male-female difference. There are basic even physiological, physical, biological differences. 
Now, in saying that, let's also remember there's nothing more like a man than a woman and nothing more like a woman than a man in God's creation. Right? So, yes, they're different, but we don't need to say that you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. They're both from the earth, dust of the ground. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. But I also think we recognize that even as the Stoics did, that, that maybe part of what we do is we're responding to this difference in our culture making and gender making. That different cultures think about what does it mean to be masculine or what does it mean to be feminine in different ways. And so what you see there is that, that different cultures are um, responding to that, the givenness, but also in some ways exercising humanity's creative potential to think about who we are uh, as male and female. Uh, and so that's uh, some food for thought. I hope in part what this taught me, what it continues to teach me is the Bible is a strange book uh, and I have to continue to dig into it to really understand what's going on in the text uh, that I see. Thank you.